Hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be presenting at UNCON for a second time. Um, I was last here to discuss my master's capstone project, working with transplant patient education back in 2019. And today I'm here to chat about something completely different, uh, working with my new employer and my favorite place to play, Visual Capitalist. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Bielan. I'm a graduate from the 1T7 cohort of the Biomedical Communications Program. And since 2021, I have been working as a visual scientific communication specialist with a company called Visual Capitalist. Essentially, I make infographics and data visualizations that support stories in the science and technology worlds. Some of you may be familiar with Visual Capitalist's work since we exist predominantly in the web space and have had a few viral hits with the work we've put out there. But for those of you who've never heard of us, allow me to make an introduction. Visual Capitalist is a Canadian news and online media firm that creates and curates visual content. We are based in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I think with our recent growth spurt, we may be just shy or have just passed over 50 employees. I'm not 100% sure, but we're a pretty decent size. You can see here the content we report on covers a wide variety of topics ranging from economics to business to pop culture and science. And predominantly, our work is centered around creating data visualizations and graphics that communicate trends or explain technical topics. We have a large readership of approximately 10 million give or take readers a month. And across our social media platforms, we've been able to amass almost 800,000 followers. We continue to support a wide variety of clients who want to use our graphic and profiling services to spotlight their work, their proprietary information, or just spotlight their company in fun and attractive visual formats. Where I fit in is that I work with the original content team. I help the company to formulate original, never been done before visuals on a variety of topics. But I like science and with my background at BMC and forming the types of stories I like to tell, I stick to the nerdy nitty gritty details that span many different scientific disciplines. I wanna share with you a few of my favorites and some of the visual strategies I undertook to visualize different scientific topics. So first one here, this piece describes an amazing concept I learned about this year called de-evolution or resurrection biology. It is the science of bringing back extinct creatures. There's a relationship here between species and DNA degradation. As time passes, DNA degrades and we lose any chance of genetically reintroducing species to our world. Part of the fun here was visualizing a timeline of extinction, but instead of showing animals on the way to their death, we can show them coming back to life. Surprisingly, we've actually been able to achieve this with a recently departed species called the Pyrenean Ibex through genetic cloning. While we can't yet sustain a population, resurrection biology has looked at ways at better conserving species who may have just recently crossed over into extinction. I had a lot of fun visualizing this sort of broken barrier and species that may be able to come back to us with time. Now this piece shows the entire chemical makeup of our bodies. The challenge here was enormous. How do you visualize the masses of objects whose values span three orders of magnitude? I had so many drafts that were trying to take something so dense and make it attractive but also to keep it accurate. I settled for consolidating the data into three groups and then working across the three orders of magnitude in that way. This piece describes the top 10 largest nuclear explosions. Now, this one isn't too scientifically minded, but I employed a unique data visualization strategy here. You can see that each of these mushroom clouds denotes the height of the explosions, but behind them is a red radius that shows how large their sonic boom or destructive radius was. 
This was a way to show two data sets on one chart. And I think it worked well to create visual associations and how we can also be creative when we're thinking about creating visual associations. Now this piece was a lot of fun. Um, I wanted to go full tilt into making the boring, super nerdy processes that happen at the cellular level a little bit simplified for a general audience. And so I took on this felt like approach to make it enticing and a lot more friendlier. One of the visual strategies I used here was to associate keywords and their visuals with color. You can appreciate this connection a little bit better when you see all of these sub narratives laid out like this. This piece, which came out maybe one or two months ago uh, about newfound water on Mars, was based on a scientific publication that had created new maps detailing where water exists on Mars. I like to push the envelope sometimes when I get into the creative mode, so I figured I'd challenge myself into animating a spinning globe and figuring out how to host it on the web. It was so much work for something so simple, but ultimately it created a much more engaging and interesting way to view a planet than to have multiple projections in one view. And finally, what I consider my crowning achievement was creating this data visualization about the biomass of life. Um, this was sort of a windfall. It was the second piece I made uh, after I started at Visual Capitalist, and I had no clue uh, about the enormous response it would receive once it was released. My approach was simply to introduce a bit of humanity into the piece, make it relatable by decorating the data with animals. This is what we call narrative load. Uh, where we can use editorial or decorative features to make quick associations with what the data is describing. Some people out there criticize this strategy in data visualization and call it chart junk. But I think in the realm of popular science, making more visual shortcuts to tell a complicated story can invite readers and potentially make lasting impressions. So hopefully you guys can appreciate this diverse sample, you know, of the different kinds of science stories I've created this year. You can see the range between space science, biodiversity, genetics and evolution, even nuclear physics, that there are a lot of exciting ways to showcase science uh, in a cool and attractive manner. And there are many more that are not captured here. Visual capitalists readership ranges from investors, stakeholders, policymakers, to everyday readers. And so my responsibility is to formulate science stories that appeal to the average person. This is a challenge in its own right, because there is a delicate balance between creating an appropriate narrative and creating accurate, but also attractive visuals. So I also wanna to share today my recipe for creating science graphics for a general audience. For me, coming up with a topic comes from a variety of different sources. Sometimes it's seeing headlines that, you know, water has been found on Mars, which are really intriguing and start, you know, asking questions. And other times it's simply eating a bowl of salad and wondering why on earth tomatoes are actually considered fruit. Part of not knowing everything is that you have to chase questions and knowing which questions to ask can be a difficult thing. For starters, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, this means you have to start somewhere, but your own biases or your lived experiences can sort of get in the way of creating a starting point and developing a story that anyone can follow for the very first time. A great resource that I use when I start with any topic is to use the website called Answer the Public. It's a web search platform that gives you insight into what the world is asking about certain topics. You can type in pretty much anything. Say I wanna do a story about, I don't know, pufferfish poison. And I wanna see what people are searching and looking to learn more about it. This is a great starting point for crafting a story around a particular question and for feeding the appetite of a general inquiry to the topic. What I like to do is I travel down this rabbit hole, answering all questions that come to my mind and slowly start crafting a visual learning experience that mirrors my own. 
Once I have most things figured out, I generally take a look at what the sources were that answered my questions. Are they popular science articles? Are they interviews or YouTube videos? Perhaps they're published academic papers. This step is important because it fuels the personality of my graphics. Depending on how granular the science is, the methods I choose to visualize science vary. I like to think of it like a spectrum. More trivia and fun fact science topics generally take on a more compositional, attractive, sometimes colorful and lighthearted representation. This is the fun stuff because you can really play up the beauty and sort of the freedom here. But as your sources become more and more academic and become more and more technical, things have to become a little bit more clear cut, less flowery, more direct, and a lot more simplified. Because science, science papers tend to be more focused and therefore more dense, we have to put all of our visual effort in simplifying the communication and not over decorating the piece. We don't want to load readers with extra visuals when they're already having to deal with extra science. And speaking of decorating, now comes the fun part. I think a huge portion of science communication requires making science palatable. In general, I like to look at science as the sort of weirdo in the party of life. It's too technical, it's complicated, it's often a buzzkill, and it can be very, very cold. We see it all the time with famous science communicators like Bill Nye or Neil deGrasse Tyson, who are able to make science fun and engaging by telling us stories that are interesting, unique, or just downright fun. I like to think of visualizing science in the same way. And so the bulk of my visual approach is to humanize science. This happens in sometimes one of two ways or sometimes both. And essentially it's appealing to emotion and also making science entertaining. Appealing to emotion is important because so much of visual design resolves, revolves around emotions. The way a horror movie's theatrical poster is designed is going to look very different than a Valentine's Day card. I think of each of my science stories as personalities and with them, we have certain emotions that they want to describe. For instance, it could be horror and disgust, or it could be tranquility and calmness. These qualities help inform the style, color, fonts, and other visual tactics I'm going to use in my illustrative and creative process. Now, when making something entertaining, what I mean is deriving visual satisfaction from the visuals. What better resource to turn to than to look at other entertainment media. For me, video games are the easiest place to get inspiration from because they combine genre, emotion, and learning within their user interfaces and menu designs. These are good places to visit when you want to explore how to arrange information, how other artists have treated iconography or fonts, and how designers have tackled compositional layout to derive satisfaction for the reader's eye. And that's pretty much it. From here on out, it's a matter of starting and reiterating until we get to a piece that is finalized and looks really, really good. Sometimes stories get trimmed or some artwork gets repurposed elsewhere, but the majority of the work is really done in the beginning stages when formulating the narrative. Making everything look good is what I consider to be the fun part, and time usually flies when that's the case. Before I go, I want to share a little bit more about how I got involved with Visual Capitalist, how my passion and curiosity in creating visual media for science has gotten me into this position. Throughout my career, I've always had the drive to do what I want to do. For a long time, that meant moonlighting after hours, chasing the sort of work I wish I could have been doing. Before joining Visual Capitalist, I would create infographics for fun. Here are a few that I made that have achieved some modest virality on social media platforms like Tumblr and Twitter. This kind of engagement, you know, while really fun to watch, started creating a platform for me to be noticed and appreciated as a scientific artist. Soon after, I was approached by Visual Capitalist after they saw my work on the web and they asked me to work full time for them, developing my brand and curating this skill set. 
I essentially summoned a job that I dreamed of by pouring value and passion into my craft. So for anyone out there that who has aspirations of doing a particular type of work or wanting a specific kind of job, the biggest piece of advice I can give is to shout from the rooftops what it is that you want. Someone just might hear you. And maybe you guys want some assistance with getting that message out there. And that's why I also want to share today Visual Capitalist's Creator Program. This year, Visual Capitalist created a platform that promotes the work of visual and graphic content creators around the world. Essentially, we post and platform the stories that you want to tell from any sort of industry, discipline, or topic that visually describes a trend, procedure, method, or general trivia fun facts. If you check out our Creator Hub online, you might notice a few familiar faces from the worlds of data visualization and graphics journalism. What makes it even better though, is that you can make money. Visual Capitalist awards $500 to everyone that gets published. Even more, if you're selected as an editor's choice, that's an extra $500. You could potentially make $1,000 off of a science story that you wanna tell and share it with millions of readers across the world. And don't worry, you have the rights, we promote your name, everything in your interest is there. We've launched the Creator Program earlier this year and had a huge response. However, if I'm being honest, the world of science graphics and visuals have been a little bit quiet. So I want to encourage everyone within the Biomedical Communications Program and its partners to take opportunity of creating a science story and getting your name and brand out there with Visual Capitalist's Creator Program. If you want to know where to go, visit visualcapitalist.com slash creator dash hub for more information. All right, that's about it um, from me today. Thank you so much for your time and for having me share my joy and pleasure with working with Visual Capitalist. I hope this presentation was informative and inspiring, and I hope to see a lot of continued excellence coming from uh, BMC and its partners over the years to come. And please submit something to the Creator Program. You just might be glad that you did. All right. Um, our last speaker in this series is going to be Jeff. Uh, so I'll let you take it away. Hi, everyone. Can, uh, can you all hear me? And do you see my screen? Yes, both. Yes to both. Okay, great. Um, thank you again for inviting me and uh, having me on this panel. I'm really excited to be sharing what I've been working on. Uh, it's uh, really been great to hear both Mark and Julie's talk. I think everyone will start to see that there's a lot of commonality in themes. I think it kind of underscores how BMC really sets us up for success in many ways, or at least lays out those, uh, those foundations that allow us to venture into different things. Um, I'm dialing in today uh, from Vancouver, and I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Vancouver is situated on the traditional and ceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Uh, it's my home city. I was born and raised here, lived here for 18 years before I decided I needed to get away. So I went to Kingston, got a bachelor in life science, um, decided I didn't want to go down uh, the medicine route. So I went to Toronto for BMC. I graduated in 2010. And from there, I proceeded to New York, Boston, uh, worked at different medical illustration and animation companies before then going back to Toronto to start a freelance career back in, I think, 2015. Uh, and that's what I've been doing the last several years. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, uh, a lot of things in my life was, uh, things were coming to a head and I had to stop. Um, so the whole thing about making sure you take care of yourself, well, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> um, but through that, I, uh, was forced to kind of reevaluate where I was going. And that's when I decided to consider fine arts as an option. 
I'm also just going to quickly point out that uh, Beihai and Shanghai are listed here. There are two port cities in China. Uh, they're, really, uh, they're really important in my family's story, and it, it explains a lot about why I decided to go into fine arts. Uh, but before I get into that part, um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the work I was creating as a medical illustrator. Um, and hopefully it will kind of illuminate the sort of thinking that uh, I had and why it translated well uh, to something that was outside our immediate field. So my thesis was on metastatic bone cancer. It was an animation project. That was my specialty. And I bring this slide up because I just wanted to point out the fact that I was um, always thinking uh, about my work through the lens of a camera. That's kind of how I see um, whatever subject matter I'm engaging with. Um, even before BMC, I considered myself a film and movie guy. Uh, I think that's why. Um, I was also drawn to things like drama and uh, to try and use landscape as a way to convey emotions. And uh, I was also interested in anthropomorphizing uh, different agents and characters, cells, uh, molecules. And I know that's dangerous territory as a science communicator because obviously we want, don't want to give agency to things that aren't, you know, so to say, sentient. Uh, you know, especially when uh, so much of biology and the mechanisms are driven by chance and probability. But that's a divergent topic. Uh, all that this to say is these are the sort of um, things I was thinking about when I was uh, designing any sort of project. Um, this next slide, uh, I think, exemplifies sort of that meta discussion I was interested in. I was always looking for ways to bring in the human side of an experience. Uh, I was thinking about, okay, so what so there's the pedagogy, there's a science, but what does that tell us about life? Is there a lesson here that speaks to, you know, going through, um, going through the world, um, aging, um, you know, kind of confronting uh, the difficulties that the world has, uh, you know, like imposes on us. Um, and in thinking about that, I am also picturing, you know, like sunrises and sunsets as a, uh, uh, as a timekeeper. And that's kind of why I created this really strong light source to kind of mimic the rising sun and these follicles, um, looking at it almost in reverence. Um, that was the, the, the feeling that I was trying to capture. Um, and I subdued that a lot as I went into, you know, my professional practice, but I was still always drawn to the landscape for uh, its ability to, to tell stories, uh, to lay things out in sort of a linear sequence. And at the same time, because of the format, to be able to engage with that information, that history in a non-linear way. Um, but beyond that, I think uh, I love the, the narrative aspect of landscapes for its ability for subtext. Um, again, to be able to communicate these ideas that were more sociological, that were more about human nature. Um, and I think Mark talks a little bit about this too, you know, how are we using uh, colors and composition to convey emotion? So, you know, using softer colors to kind of convey a sense of nurturing and coddling on the left, but then using darker colors and like uh, depth to convey this idea that there's a journey to be had. Um, and again, in creating this, I'm also thinking about, you know, deep time, chronology, inheritance, life, and all these other themes. Um, so meta discussion uh, was this kind of fixation on it, uh, was why I preferred working in pre-production. That's where I felt I excelled the most. I love the conceptual. I love the ideation. Um, because I was always, you know, creating pieces and thinking about, okay, what does, you know, the MRI machine say? What does this negative space say? What does the lighting say? Is there value there beyond the, the pedagogical? I was always trying to push those kind of boundaries um, to move from the objective into the subjective because I felt that there was a lot of value there um, beyond just, you know, enticing people with the image. Um, but that there was some sort of uh, ability to connect with audience uh, in a meaningful way, but in a different way. 
Um, and this was the most apparent actually on a project that was perhaps the most, uh, the, the least anthropomorphic, uh, I would say. I was working with uh, Gail at Digizyme on creating diagrams to, uh, to teach people about fluid dynamics. So we we're using thin lines, thick lines, dashed lines, dotted lines, all these different uh, visual tools to help build better mental models for learners who were engaging with this material for the first time. Um, and on this project, I had created some storyboards just to, for a short animation, showing a disturbance uh, growing in a field of molecules, um, showing how uh, patterns are being created behind it. And as the disturbance gets larger, you know, you lose that symmetry and you have a wake and uh, turbulence that's uh, uh, created behind the object. And in the process, you know, uh, because I was driven by design objectives, I was, I was also thinking about, okay, what if I take up the outline of the circle? Does it actually improve the, uh, the message? Does it add value? And for me, it did, but in a completely unexpected way. When I look at the image on the right, suddenly I'm not seeing fluid dynamics anymore. And this might be just my own condition, <laughs> but each of these dots to me, talked about life, talked about memory. Each of these were little life moments that were passing us by. And as we encounter challenges and losses, trauma, that's represented by the negative space. And the larger they are, the more turbulence they create. And in quite literally in their wake, they leave behind patterns and influences on our own experience as we journey throughout life. So this project I finished in 2019 or so, and it's what really precipitated in me this idea that maybe there's something here that I should be investigating, uh, if not for myself, uh, maybe for like, you know, my communities. And I say communities because of something else that was happening uh, in parallel to my career as a medical illustrator. So uh, I'm gonna pivot a little bit, talk about, uh, a, something really personal. In my late teens, um, the last of my grandparents passed away. And when my father's father passed away, we uncovered in his will and, uh, and just in his possessions letters of family, uh, allusions to people and places that we had never heard about. I think uh, for a lot of uh, those of us who have any experience with uh, grandparents from that generation, you know, Second World War, post Second World War, a lot of people took oaths of silence um, because uh, there were histories that were too painful to talk about. So um, because of that, my parents' generation, as well as my own, obviously, we had no idea that we had cousins and possibly aunts and uncles back in places that you know, we've never visited. Uh, but now that we knew, out of curiosity, we actually uh, took pilgrimages back to my uh, both my mom's uh, family's hometowns as well as my dad's, and we did some amateur sleuthing. So we took you know these little papers with names and places, and we literally went down streets knocking on doors, saying, hey, "Do you know a you know someone by the name of Chung who used to do this, or maybe this or this lived here?" Um, and it was this wild journey. But at the end of it we were able to find family on both my mom and my dad's side. So this here is my grand aunt, who is my grandfather's sister, whom uh, we had zero contact for over 50, 60 years. They didn't know of our existence, we didn't know of their existence. And in this experience, there was such tremendous joy and yet trauma and pain. And it forced my parents' generation, as well as my generation, to kind of recontextualize our own identity um, I mean, that's not an exaggeration. It fundamentally shifted the way I saw myself as a Canadian, as a first-generation Canadian, um, as a settler, uh, as a Chinese person. Um, you know, I had to really contend with my own sort of indigeneity in a sense as well, going back to these places in China, which is where my roots are. Um, even though I've never stepped foot uh, in these lands until that point in time. So I think, you know, now in looking back, it's no surprise that because of these experiences, 
that, uh, you know, I was being influenced to uh, seek answers in the metaphysical, to seek patterns and metaphors and allegories in the science, because I was trying to contend with these uh, really big questions. Um, but having said all this, I still wouldn't have gone into fine arts if the pandemic didn't hit. Um, in 2020, uh, the confluence of things that I had alluded to earlier, it came to a head. Um, I was at my most uh, unhealthy state. I had been suffering from uh, chronic pain for over 20 years, combination of uh, disc herniations, pinched nerves, scoliosis, all that stuff, and also uh, had been suppressing a lot of mental health issues, uh, depression, anxiety, insomnia, things that I had not addressed meaningfully in my life. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, uh, you know, I came to a point where I literally could not physically work. Um, and it was a good thing because I had to take a sabbatical. And when I did, I decided to go into art to find, uh, um, well, first of all, something to do, uh, but also as a way to provide myself therapy, essentially. So I used painting as a way to express things I was going through. Um, and to uh, just uh, explore topics that I wouldn't have, I guess, um, either through diary or through, um, I guess, medical illustration, because these are not the type of topics I necessarily go into. But as I was kind of developing this new visual language, I found that in my interaction with other people, I was able to communicate uh, with uh, on, on a completely different level. You know, I was no longer communicating, you know, you know, objective science, pedagogy, all that stuff. I was communicating on a much more intuit, intuitive and uh, human way. Um, people were perceiving the emotions that I was, uh, you know, that I had when I'm painting these objects. Um, and that really kind of surprised me. It was a bit of a revelation that I was able to communicate in that way. So I got uh, bolder and I started creating projects that uh, talked about identity, that talked about ritual. This is a series where um, I'm using the action of folding and unfolding clothes um, as a way to kind of address my own sense of identity, but also to speak to a broader um, kind of narrative of how clothing is used as, you know, costumes, as protection, as a way for us to engage uh, with the world through a filter. Um, and I also got a chance to go back to fluid dynamics, but this time without those pedagogic limitations, you know, I was now exploring the more subjective. I was using flower petals, embedding them in acrylic uh, to talk about the decay and erosion of memory and of time. And bringing that into my photographic practice uh, as well, I was now using the skills I had picked up uh, doing film and animation uh, to create these multiple exposure pieces that were still very cinem cinematic, still very narrative driven, but creating what I call uh, memory landscapes to, um, to bring people in this, to this meditative state of mind where you know, there's disorder in the memory in that sort of like that action of trying to be nostalgic. Um, and yeah, again, the, the experience of creating these pieces, but more importantly, of being able to engage with audience members in a new way, um, it really kind of revealed to me the fact that I could be doing a lot of good as well uh, through this kind of work. You know, I was informing people, not necessarily, not necessarily at, uh, from the perspective of science education, but of um, more social uh, education. Um, talking about matters that can heal and uh, offer meaning and truth in a completely different way. And that's when I decided to apply for a Master of Fine Arts at Emily Carr. And that's, this is what led me to Vancouver. And right now, uh, I'm only my first semester, so I'm still very much uh, like floundering in all this. <laughs> but uh, I am continuing my investigations into uh, home. Um, my practice is very much autoethnographical, 
And uh, I'm using the, uh, my family's experience, the immigrant experience as a way to kind of uh, uh, investigate land, earth, and other elements um, as, uh, as tools, as mnemonic tools for uh, immigration or displacement, how it informs us of our sense of home, how it then informs or allows us to, or even prevents us from engaging in uh, the lands we then move into or the places we visit. And I'm bringing that medical illustration rigor, that same sort of research methodology into my practice, as well as the visual language, you know, using data visualization, uh, infographics to create imagery, but then not allowing myself uh, to be limited by pedagogy in this case, um, and really pushing the more intuitive, the more spiritual and meditative quality of um, the visual language. Um, so I'm really excited to see where I go. I don't know where I'm going quite yet. I mean, my uh, research might evolve over the next couple of years. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited to be able to be learning about this new way of communication. Um, so if you would like to uh, follow this journey of mine, uh, please follow me on social media or go to my website. You can subscribe to a newsletter. Uh, I won't spam you. I only post every few months. Um, and yeah, otherwise, thank you so much for having me and for listening to my talk. And I'll hand it back to you guys at the NCA. All right. Thank you, Jeff. That was a beautiful presentation. And, and thank you so much for sharing with, with this group um, personal information about your life. Um, you know, it, it takes, takes a lot to be able to do that. And I think there's a lot of value in sharing it. So we really appreciate you talking about those things. Um, so that concludes the, the speaker series. Um, we're going to have a Q&A here at the end for anybody who has questions for Jeff or Julie. Um, again, Mark, Mark isn't here today, but if you have questions for him, um, you're welcome to direct them to him on his uh, social media. Um, and I will uh, open up the floor for anybody who has questions. Just seeing a lot of comments in the chat here about how amazing the presentations were. So well done, everybody. I'll jump in um, just to say that I really appreciated your talks, Julia, uh, Julie and, and Jeff, um, you know, just in the sense of, of good reminders to take time for ourselves and kind of um, be more introspective and pursue creative outlets that bring joy and meaning and uh yeah it's good there's some there's some chat in discord by the way use the discord everyone uh if you'd like um quick question for jeff do you have any prints available uh i do um you can see the images on my website um i have links there um and uh, yeah, just give me a shout on either on social media or e email me. Um, and yeah, uh, I do have friends. <laughs>